Okay, let's continue our countdown of evil. Um, so, talk about Apple. Let's move on to evil again. Google, huge, huge company, right? You know, a company that's become a verb. You know, you Google something if you want to find out about it. So Google obviously began as a search company. This is a picture of what uh, Google looked like in 2001. Um, Origins is a software company, so producing the search engine. Their mission, as they begun, was to organize the information in the world. Now, that's kind of a huge mission statement. You know, you're going to organize all the world's knowledge. You organize all the world's knowledge. You've got power over all the world's or, or knowledge because you're organizing how it's being disseminated as well. So they always had this like God view of themselves. Um, this was uh, mission was based on the page rank algorithm. So they organized through algorithmic sorting, which they controlled, which they wrote. And again, I'm using that word control, right? Google's mission right from the beginning was all about controlling access to knowledge. As they develop, they bought YouTube in 2007 for what was an incredible price at the time, $1.65 billion. Although it pays off now when, uh, you know, the revenues that YouTube produces. It was a logical acquisition because if you're looking to um, build your um, entire business on a successful advertising mod um, model, then you need to go where people's eyeballs are, which was Google, which was YouTube in 2007. They monetize content with deals with broadcast content providers and subscription services. But what I need to talk about very briefly here is what we mean by the advertising model. So Google gets its money and Google got its uh, marketplace through monetizing search. OK, every search that you did, Google saved and was then able to market that data on what you were looking for to its advertising partners. So that little uncanny moment you get when you search for something on Google and then you get the advert for it on Facebook. That's not an accident. That's how the system is built. And these companies, although they're in competition with one another, they trade with one another, you know, so, you know, it's not an unusual thing. So in terms of developments, Google also wanted a piece of an, another major market. So they were for mobile phones, developed and owned the Android operating system for smartphones, launched it in 2007. By 2010, they'd overtaken Apple and iOS. And now they dwarf Apple in terms of um you know, share of the market. You know, 85% of the global market of smartphones runs Android compared to iOS running about 12%. Link it up to Google Pay. And why do they make it open source? Why is, why can Apple's, uh, sorry, why can Google's um, Android operating system run on anything? Because they wanted it used on every phone. So Google aren't about selling services. You know, you search, you don't pay to search on Google. You don't pay to have a Gmail account. You don't, I mean, you pay for an Android phone, but you don't pay for the operating system. So what are you getting, you know, with what is going on here? Why is Google so benevolent? It's not benevolent. It's just hoovering up data. It's hoovering up activity online and using that to build profiles of people in order to sell. So, Google basically is a very, very evil company. They want to organize everything in the world and then they want to sell everyone that uses it. So Scott Galloway uses an analogy of God to describe the kind of power relationship that Google has to the mere mortal users of its servers, of its services. The power desired by Google is the knowledge not only of what we do, and it knows that because Google runs on everything, you know, Google is everywhere, but also what we want to do through that organization of the world's information. So it wants to not just be able to predict, but to shape what we do. It's not about prediction. It's not about you know, creating algorithms that will predict our behavior. It's about shaping our very choices of what we can do. Again, it's a level of control, which is extreme. It's another major cultural industry, which is all about control. So Google's aim is to stockpile information and use that information to build artificial models of mind that can be used to predict what we do. As Galloway pictures it, Google knows that we walk through the mall, we lust for a pair of Tony Birch, Jolie Pumps or Bose Quiet Comfort headphones. He knows that you have a thing for girls with tattoos. Google knows all this stuff about you. 
The objective of harvesting personal information is not individual tracking of the whole population. It's about creating some kind of cybernetic governance system. Sorry, I know there's a bit off the slide here, but you can check it out on the slides on, um, on Canvas, right? But basically, if you collect enough data, you have enough data points to make predictions and to have elements of control. And what we have then is a form of cybernetic governance. Google will be able to both know what people will do and to shape the very options that they can choose in a particular situation. That's entirely about controlling society. That's scary. Okay, Google had a strap line once saying, don't be evil. But I can't think of anything much more evil than wanting to have the power to control individuals across the world. But guess what? There's some people are more evil. Facebook began as an aggregation site, right? Based on user profile on your personal network. You had a feed, a wall, instant messaging, messages themselves, comments and other social features, a hosting site for videos and photos, free all-in-one service for applications that we previous to Facebook were spread all across the web and were actually you know, fairly disparate and quite difficult to use. What does it want Facebook it wants all of you. It wants everything. It wants a complete picture of you in order to target you for advertising online and offline, on Facebook and off Facebook. It wants to understand everything that you do prior to making that click where you buy something. And then it wants to reproduce it and it wants to tell people what you do in order for you to be marketed at more efficiently. You're the product. They want to know everything about you and you're the product. And again, I've said this previously, but it's like, I don't use Facebook. You use Instagram, you use WhatsApp. They're doing the same thing. And in fact, you don't need to use any of them. Facebook's cookies are all across the web. They are hoovering inf information, even if you're not a user. Even if you don't have an account, they have an account on you. That's Facebook. How do they do this? They do it through acquisition. They don't make anything of their own. Just like Google didn't make YouTube. They didn't make WhatsApp. They didn't make Instagram. Basically, Google, Facebook has two particular models of acquisition. If it's something it wants, it'll buy it and use it, like Instagram. And if it's something that's a threat to it, it'll buy it and shut it down. And that's their two <laughs> ways of doing it. So they control the flows of data by owning what people use to communicate. And then they're in partnership with major data brokerage firms in order to refine, in order to bring together different data flows of people, in order to make the perfect digital image of you. But it's not an image of you. It is an image of you as a consumer because it just wants to sell you. So these firms purchase your personal data from companies you've done business with, combine it with all the other information they can find about you and sell it to companies that want to know more about you. The amount of detail contained in these consumer dossiers is astonishing. It knows everything. You know that really freaky porno you were watching? They know. With the resources it receives from Axiom and other data brokers, Facebook could hypothetically serve sober ads to teenagers who recently purchased a soft drink at a convenience store or diaper ads to parents who bought baby food at a department store. Now, they've got notes about privacy, but don't listen to them. This is the model. Facebook builds you. It builds the digital you in order for you to be marketed. That's why it's such a dangerous company. Because when you think about what it markets. You know, we had a huge amount of controversy about the role of Facebook in the Brexit um, uh, referendum in 2016 in this country and in the 2016 presidential election. And in fact, so many elections around the world, it doesn't even bear thinking about. Facebook doesn't just buy and sell. You know, it's not just about products, it's about politics. It's about democratic choices. Facebook collects all this information and what happened with Cambridge Analytica in 2016 in terms of Brexit and in terms of the election of Trump was it had so many data points that it could pinpoint individuals who might be tempted by one piece of information. So one of the most important marketing tools for Brexit was targeting people with specific adverts about the EU 
being really, really poor on animal rights. It actually isn't. The adverts were false as well. But if you target people who are really keen on animal rights with this information, it showed up that these people were likely to tip the balance towards voting to leave the European Union. And if you do that enough times, and just prior to the uh, Brexit election, they targeted, what, 50? <laughs> they, they, they sent out literally hundreds of millions of targeted adverts to particular groups of people in order to change their minds. In terms of democracy and in terms of society, therefore, Facebook is very, very dangerous in terms of how it operates. What are data brokers all about? By insisting that the process is designed so that no personal information is exchanged between Facebook and the marketers, the truth of the situation is that data brokers already own your personal information and their collaboration with the social network may allow them to assemble even more detailed profiles of your health and habits in the future. It's really, really scary. Amazon are also scary, maybe less so. Content provider that want to dominate provision. And the reason why I think they're really, really dangerous is Amazon's aim is to make them the one-stop shop for everything. Now, <laughs> that's really, really scary. You're only buying from one company. One company dominates everything. That's scary. Now, that's not Amazon in practice but it is in terms of what they want to do. And if we look at the past, what, six months in terms of lockdown, Amazon just went through the roof. They became everyone's retailer of choice. They make devices only directly to push content sales. Now they began as a, really as a bookshop, but they now position themselves as a producer, an entire entertainment hub, physical sales, digital sales, streaming of books, music, TV, films, games, so moving beyond physical delivery to instant net delivery and a hosting service. Most of the web is hosted by Amazon. So they're everywhere. In terms of cloud computing, Amazon Web Services, S3 and Amazon EC2, they became the largest cloud computing service provider in the world, renting servers by the minute and hosting web content for businesses. Amazon control the very structure of the internet, things that run on servers. You have to host somewhere. You're hosting on Amazon. They are everywhere. Again, hoovering up data, and hoovering up data in order to sell their products and their things which are on their store more efficiently to you. So what are we left with here? Control is absolutely the key issue for everything here. What happens when control is so absolute that a company control what you see and what you can do when using digital media? Those are the questions we need to answer. Donald and Hawkeye might be turning in their graves at this point. Digital giants are not the only organizations that we need to consider because governments are allowing this to happen and they're happy for it to happen and they're basically not charging these people any tax either. So the issue is local and global and therefore there's a transparency movement that challenges this move to control and that's what I'll talk about in the next video. All the business models of the major companies are about control. So we need to ask, how does the internet itself facilitate this control? And we also need to ask if there's a way to break the control enforced on us for business reasons. And that's what I'll go on to next. But what do we need to know about industry in the contemporary world? They all want to control you. They all want to know as much about you as possible to predict what you do, to control what you can do, and to sell you to advertisers. Video three coming up.